Those of you who have been AV regulars for a number of years will remember David Bellamy's first presentation at the AV2, in fact, at the Heathrow Hotel, where he was a bit crestfallen because, you know, he'd lost his media career and uh, it was all down to the fact that he refused to be the mouthpiece for the climate change agenda. And in fact, he was quoted, of course, in, famously in the Daily Express for saying it was poppycock then and it's poppycock now. <laughs> And uh, then you remember that he came back two years later. He came back, or no, it was a year later, actually. It was April 2010. And um, he was like, uh, I mean, he was in his 80s, remember? But I mean, he was, he was like you know, a new lease of life because the Climate Gate emails had been released and they'd effectively vindicated a lot of what he was saying because the Climate Gate emails demonstrated, at the very least, that there was a significant amount of corruption within the scientific community that was being used to promote the climate change agenda. Well, Piers Corbyn first came onto my radar. He won't know this, of course, but he first came onto my radar in 2002 uh, when I came back to the UK after being out of the UK for much of, well, the last previous 14 years or so. And um, I was chatting with somebody and they said, oh, have you come across Piers Corbyn? And I said, no, I don't think so. And they said, this guy's weather forecasts are absolutely amazing. He produces the most accurate weather forecasts of anyone. Log range weather forecasts, yeah. So thank you for the correction. <laughs> and uh, this is now widely acknowledged, and there's a number of articles, there's been uh, documentaries or programs that have absolutely corroborated that statement that I first heard in 2002. So here we are 15 years later, and it is my absolute pleasure, Piers, to welcome you to AV8. Thank you, thank you sir. Well, first of all, it's amazing to be here with all these, uh, well, a conference of amazing minds, I would say. I mean, I've been stunned at every conversation I've had. Uh, and I especially want to thank Ian for actually making these things happen. And, uh, you know, all the presentations I've seen have also been amazing. Um, and the last one from uh, Olzi Jacecki, I think, really summarised, you know, so much that we need to understand. Uh, and there's a lot more we need to understand. Okay, now I'm going to talk about, as it says here, man-made global warming is a hoax, what does change climate and the terminal crisis of globalisation. Whoops. But first, I should just make a point about the current situation. Uh, because as you know, I am my brother's brother. Uh, or he used to be my brother and now I'm his brother. Okay. But... Now is the most important general election of your life. Okay? Because the whole political scene in Britain is up for grabs. And if it goes one way or the other in Britain, a lot of other countries in the world will follow. You see, the globalisation freaks are desperately fighting for their lives. And... If, if my brother wins, and he can win with your help. I mean, there was a rally yesterday of 20,000 people up in northwest England. 20,000 people. That's a hundred times this room. Okay. And, you know, they came at, what, three days' notice or something. That's astounding. Now, that is going on in the country now. The mainstream media do not report it. But as this uh, campaign machine goes around, Labour can win and we can stop the globalisation agenda. I mean, you might have all sorts of political views here, but this is your one chance to get a real debate going in Britain. Because if Jeremy wins, you know, the doors open for all sorts of discussions, which will be shut down by Theresa May if she wins again. And just so you understand a few things, what really might be going on in this election. First of all, over the Maastricht and Lisbon treaties, Jeremy Corbyn voted against them. And they took away, you know, all the rights of Britain and so on, right? Theresa May voted for them. So what is this election about? My, my guess is actually, if the Tories get a bigger majority, they'll be more flexible, so-called, and they will betray Brexit with the aid of the European Union and the globalists. That's what I think is probably on the agenda. But the key is, if we win, then we can stop 
stop betrayal of Brexit, i.e. have Brexit properly, and fight the globalisers. So what should you be doing? You should have registered to vote if you haven't. Tell all your friends to register to vote, and you've got until 23.59 hours tomorrow. And go along to key marginals to make sure uh, UKIP people that are, don't know what to do, switch to Labour, not the Tories, and whatever, but win those key marginals. And then we can have a better world. Thank you. <laughs> right. Now, OK, on other things, I've got here, uh, I know this is still props and all that jazz. We've got, you don't normally have people with so many props. Here I have a 9-11 mug, and I've got a lot of these 9-11 mugs about, you know, 9-11 and what happened, was it a nuclear explosion and so forth. It's in German, unfortunately, but don't worry about that. Um, <laughs> but I've got a stack of them, and anyone who buys our weather forecast at a super reduced rate online now will get a mug from me today. <laughs> OK, so do it, please, because... Um, well, like Ian, you know, w w money doesn't fall out of the skies as it does if George Soros helps you. Um, so, you know, we all need cash flow. OK, right, now, let us move on with things. Right, well, there's slide one. So, slide two then, two and three, it's about who I am, which we just stick on because people... You know, don't believe who I am sometimes. But just to say, I wrote scientific papers when I was still at school and uh, I've had these ideas of long-range forecasting for a long time. And um, they only came about because of the... Uh, can't find it. But anyway, um, 1984, I, uh, I'd been trying ideas of long-range forecasting. I'd given up. And the miners' strike came along and some people said to me, Oh, Piers, you, you know about the weather. Is it going to be a cold winter, 84, 85? I said, look, I don't know. They said, you, you go, go on, find out, tell us. Now, they want, I was in the International Marxist Group at the time, one of the 17 Trotskyist groups in the country at the time. Um, and uh, I did go back to do the research. They wanted me to pop up with the answer, you know, that they wanted. But I did actually find the answer they wanted, not because they wanted me to want it, but because it was there. And I said, it is going to be a damn cold winter. And it was. So then I carried on and we're here now as a consequence. So we should thank both Arthur Scargill and Margaret Thatcher. Because without them fighting, I probably wouldn't have done that. Anyway, we did commercial, uh, well, we did test weather bets with William Hill and I made lots of money on that. Uh, but then they ended the test bets and I set up a company which... Uh, we took off the stock exchange after a while, but, you know, it was all okay. Next one. This is just background stuff, which you've got to get out of the way. We've had peer-reviewed papers. No other long-range forecasters have had peer-reviewed studies of their long-range forecast because they have no skill. Okay, next one. Um, yeah, that's mentioned already. Okay, ah, right, this is good. Okay, now we're going to talk about, first of all, what the science is all about. Then we'll move into the politics stuff. Uh, first of all, yeah, next one, and it appears on the side. You, things are not always what they seem. Now, you're people who know that, but a lot of people just don't know that. They believe newspapers. Now, this, of course, is a diagram which shows water can flow uphill. Look, it does. There it is, going uphill, it comes down again. Uphill, down again. Isn't that amazing? It's, a big, it's true, look, see it, it's there it is. <laughs> but, of course, the trouble is, if you try and make that with the bits of wood, they wouldn't fit together, OK? But the point is, in science, just the same as in this diagram, you can conjure up things which look as if they're true when they're not. And global warming ideas, including the arrows of radiation, so-called, which justify their theory, are this type of illusion. illusion. That is exactly right. And I'm spotlighting this man. Um, OK, there's other stuff which uh, we can talk about more at the workshop, if you want, about other things which are fundamentally wrong with the way uh, certain things in this... Well, on my side and the other side are presented. OK, let's go on. Right. Now, we know the CO2 theory doesn't work, and it's not because of all the meddling and climate gate. And by the way, over on the wall there, Ian has very kindly put up the 
document which um, um, which David Bellamy gave you. Is that right? That's correct. That's correct. And it's got all these emails in there, fantastic stuff, you know. And it includes on there that, did you know, and there's some letter to somebody, we got a real troublemaker over here called me. Okay. Um, anyway, uh, <laughs> that is living history, that stuff. Um, but the reason why their theory fails is because the theory fails. It's not because they lied, which they did, but um, it's because their predictions all fail. Okay, and actually carbon dioxide levels are an effect, not a cause of changes in climate. That is a observed fact. So that's the first thing to say to anyone that argues with you. And the other things are that all the extremes now reported are the wrong type of extremes for the CO2 story. Now, by that I mean, here we have, da -da, the globe. Okay, now the jet stream, is this, uh, symbolically with this, this is fast air that goes round and round, okay, upper air. Now, uh, when it goes, um, uh, if you've got a warmer world, I've got to show Britannia facing you, I know you prefer that. Um, okay, uh, a warmer world, the jet stream is going to be shorter, further north, like this, okay? So the colder area is smaller and the warmer area is bigger. A colder world, it gets longer, and got more wild swings in it. Now, right now we haven't got a shorter one. We've had a longer one for the last five, five or ten years, basically. So it's the wrong type of circulation for the global warming theory. Completely wrong. Okay. So, and these extremes that are happening are because the jet stream goes up and down a lot and it can bring cold air down, so you get these sudden cold things and warm air can come up and you get sudden warm things. So you can have warm Arctic and cold, cold, uh, cold Britain, for example. Uh, and that is a consequence of the wild jet stream. Uh, it's nothing to do with the CO2 theory. So all the extremes happening now are actually a negation of the CO2 theory. OK? Uh, and all their predictions have failed anyway. Right, so to summarise, there's three or four key points as to why it doesn't work. One is, if you look at the actual evidence, carbon dioxide levels follow changes in temperature by a lag of a few hundred years. Second thing is that if man is going to be in charge, then that, um, the CO2 that nature produces has to be somehow dominated by man. Now, man only produces 4% of the CO2 that goes in and out of the sea all the time. So man's CO2, if it's going to dominate nature, requires a conspiracy of nature. So that animals or whatever have to, if you drive a car down the road, the animals have to think, oh my God, oh, there goes a man producing CO2, let's do the same. I mean, otherwise, nature would rule and it would just be random. For example, termites produce 10 times more CO2 than mankind. So let's have war on termites. I mean, I haven't heard that one. Better, better to do that than have a war on the people of Kosovo, frankly. You, you know, but they don't do that. So we know they don't believe their own theory anyway, and I've got some examples to prove that later on. Um, the reason why is the basic laws of physics point out that carbon dioxide levels are going to be in equilibrium with the uh, amounts in any um, liquid they're in equilibrium with, the C. 70% of the globe covered in sea, there's 50 times more CO2 in the sea than in the air. Warm up the sea a bit, like warm up a bottle of pop, the CO2 comes off. Cool it down, and it will absorb more. Okay, well that's all that's happening. And there's a lag of some hundreds of years because the circulation patterns of the sea are so slow and complicated that the medieval warm period, for example, of 800 years ago, is now probably evidencing in the extra CO2 around. Okay? Uh, so we covered that, and you've switched on the next one, thinking in advance. That's very good. Um, <laughs> just to say, we've put these points to various professors, uh, including Professor, or I would say pseudo-Professor, Brian Cox, who's the <laughs> biggest twerp this side of the moon. Um, <laughs> This one, they've got an unfortunate 
commonality. They seem to be Brian something seems to pop up all the time. Anyway, Brian Hoskins, I asked him a question at Imperial College. Come on, give us the evidence, man. And he, that was some months, no, a year ago now. No reply. Anyway, they won't reply because they haven't got any reply. But any, if you meet them, just demand evidence of them. All right, next one. Um, we've done the wrong type of extremes. I've explained that. Uh, wrong type of extremes, good phrase to use. Okay, next one. Um, now, we've had a lot of discussion about Arctic. They will say, oh, yeah, look, the Arctic's doing this, Arctic's doing that. And I said, look, hang on. No, 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 no. As I said, if the Arctic warms, it's because the jet stream has gone wild. Now, in 1816... Um, well, the Royal Society wrote to the Admiralty in 1817 to say the Arctic, and this was the, 1816 was the year of no summer, right? Lousy, 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 just like 2012, very similar to that. Right, the Royal Society wrote to the Admiralty and said there's, there's not much ice around in the Arctic. And they were, like, puzzled, you know. Well, that's the point. There was wild jet stream then as there's wild jet stream now. So the, the, evident, the warming of the Arctic, so-called temporary, is, is evidence of nothing at all. In fact, all these warmings are like dipoles. There will be a warm in here, there'll be colding down there. For example, that warming of the Arctic just before Christmas was associated with snow in the Sahara Desert. Okay. And the cold area was bigger than the warm area. Um, okay. So low Arctic ice doesn't doesn't or, or it doesn't indicate man-made climate change or anything. All right, it's nothing to do with CO2. Next one. What's actually happening now in Greenland is the ice levels are reaching record amounts. Record amounts. Now, they normally say, oh, well, less ice in Greenland proves it. Well, there was more ice, so they say, oh, well, that's because the sea's warmer and there's more snow. Well, okay, say what the hell you want, but... Whatever happens, they just claim it's CO2. It's a lie. All right, next one. Right, this is quite important. Um, if you look at actual data, this is American data, so it applies to the whole world, right? Any Americans here? <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> the actual temperatures fluctuate like this, you see? And they've got about a 60-year cycle between one and the other. CO2 is just going up like this. That's what's actually happening. So the CO2 and temperatures correlate here. They anti-correlate there. They correlate in this bit and so on. And now they're anti-correlating again using real data. Another thing they claim, and I can't do this because I can't hide. If I hide it, it just projects, doesn't it? But um, if I stand in front of this bit and you can't see it. You see, they give you this bit and say, oh, look, there's a sudden rapid rise in the last 10 years of temperatures. Well, that's true. But 60 years ago, there was another one. And 60 years before that, there was another one. So there's a cyclicity in the rate of change as well, which is all about 60 years. And this actually comes from, in our theory of the solar lunar action technique, it's beats between the magnetic linkage of the sun and the crossing of the plane of the Earth's orbit by the moon. OK. And there is a little formula for you, if you like formulae. Any... Any maths kids here under 16, they'd probably understand this, but all of us who've got older than 16 have difficulty. I know we're formally. OK. Anyway, it speaks... Oh, it doesn't matter. We can do it in full in the workshop if you want. Let's move on. Right, now, moving on to the politics. What really does... Do, do these policies affect? Well, one, the policies we've had have not reduced CO2 production, but they've relocated it. We've closed down northern England and moved the steel production to India. Well, they're producing much, just as much CO2 there. But you paid for it to be moved. You paid your taxes to the European Union. They shoveled money to one of these Indian companies to, you know, save the planet. And uh, people in northeast England lost their jobs. OK. Or they're busy doing servicing and sort of delivering pizzas to each other and stuff like that. OK. Well, it's important to have pizzas, isn't it? You know. Um, but <laughs> it's a nonsense. It does not reduce CO2. That's a fact. The economic effects are catastrophic. And it's not just North East England, but the, the barges produced in Finland that were carrying the iron ore over to, to the North East have been closed down and so on. Instead, we have a phony casino economy of asset stripping, uh, globalisation and theft. 
and the whole shebang puts up energy and oil prices because they want high oil prices to justify telling farmers to burn corn, You've got to have a high enough price to so they sell it to burn, burn corn, burn maize. Um, uh, and I don't think it says in the Bible, burn food, by the way. Um, uh, but the oil companies actually are completely hand in glove with the CO2 story. Uh, and we'll explain that later, as you want. The other thing is the left has sort of got completely lost because when I was around in the 60s or 80s or 70s or whatever, 84, for example, the left was, oh, yeah, we support coal and we oppose nuclear. Well, now they oppose coal and support nuclear. Um, this is all very strange. Basically, the left is, as it's, these labels aren't useful anymore, but, you know, those types are actually uh, being smothered by the globalists. All right, next one. So the economic and political impacts of the climate change ideology. Uh, big change in the world economy. Big money-wasting expensive projects. Uh, well, they're money-wasting for us, but they make money for big, big corporations based in Wall Street. Energy prices up, I've explained. The emotion of true green action, this is quite important. So uh, biodiversity is important, right? We defend that absolutely. But it, this gets lost in all these anti-CO2 games. And we've got more pollution and deaths. We've got more diesel, diesel power all over the place, uh, which is, is most unhealthy. And you've got mercury in all these, the, these low energy light bulbs. Um, and the European Emissions Trading Scheme, as I said, has already been used to destroy northeast England. Um, um, the nuke and coal pair has been swapped around. OK, next one. Now, key things about what they told us. They said we'd have world runaway warming. Well, the world's actually got colder We've, uh, in real data. We've had droughts and heat waves, they said, but no, we've had floods and cold. End of snow, end of snow by 2010. Well, we've had dramatically more snow. More US hurricanes, we've had less US hurricanes. We've had some very big ones, which we predicted, by the way, but the numbers uh, are, are reduced. Massive ice melts, no. They tell you when it melts, this is BBC, but they don't tell you when they refreezes. Um, early springs? No, we've had late springs. This year being another example. Large sea level rises? No. We've had some slow sea level rises at the same rate for the last 200 years. The sea level is rising slowly since the end of the last ice age because the uh, water is warming up very slowly as heat goes downwards and the ocean is therefore expanding. All right, next one. Right, actual facts. If Big Ben represented the atmosphere, carbon dioxide would be represented by one or two inches on the top of Big Ben Tower. And man's contribution to that CO2 would be represented by a blob of birchit on the top of that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so. <laughs> Need I say, it's shit to believe that that birdshit can run the show, okay? Um, this is only 0.04% of CO2 in the atmosphere, and man is 4% of that. Okay, um, we've done termites, let's go on. <coughs> right, what actually goes on, if you look at the real data, is we have these temperature things, medieval optimum, which appeared in the early IPCC, that's the Climate Change Committee of the United Nations, early IPCC things, but they rubbed it out. Uh, later. But this uh, optimum there coincided with more solar activity and these coal bits, the mini ice ages or the Dickens with the, the, the uh, that's the most recent one, the Dalton minimum, the Maunder minimum, they corresponded minimum solar activity there, cold. Minimum solar activity here, cold. Okay, so generally solar activity, more solar activity means a warmer planet. Okay, next one. The same thing, well, if you look at lots and lots of long data going back 500 million years, the, uh, this one is carbon dioxide and the blue one is temperature. So there's not a correlation. They go, both go all over the place. But just worth noting, we're now at a very low level of 
carbon dioxide. In fact, we got da we're at a dangerously low level of carbon dioxide, and if you halved it now, uh, some plants would have difficulty surviving. It'd be much better to double the amount of CO2, and then the tomatoes would grow 40% faster. So any of you who are doing gardening, you should know that. All right, <coughs> next one. <laughs> yes, this is um, Al Gore's lie. Um, he said, oh yeah, look, it's grass. Now time goes this way here. This is the one of CO2, and there's the temperature. Oh look, the temperature follows the CO2. Oh. Really? Okay. Well, one thing is you notice there's a lot more variation in the, C in the temperature than there is in the CO2. Well, okay, so how can something that's slowly changing cause something which is changing with a more periodicity? That's a nonsense to start with. But the next thing is, oh, by the way, if you look into this, there's various signals of 43,000 years and 26,000 years. Um, the 43,000 years is there's a periodicity in the tilt of the Earth, like this, it goes like this with a period of 43,000 years, and it, the direction it points precesses, actually goes this way, with a period of 26,000 years. So the beats between these will give you ice ages. So uh, uh, 3 times 43 is uh, 129, and 4 times 26 is uh, uh, 100. Whatever, close to it anyway. <laughs> so about 130,000 years, you'll get these things coinciding. And the last big ice age, sorry, big warm period, we're in a warm period now, and there was another one before, 130,000 years ago. Okay. Um, the natural state of the world, by the way, is ice age. So we're going to head for another one, whatever, whatever Tony Blair wishes, um, and then the Russians will come. And the Norwegians, and the Swedes, and the Finns, <laughs> and the Scots even. <laughs> even if they become independent, they'll still have to come. Okay, uh, next one. So what actually happens, this is time going this way, Antarctic temperatures, for example, go up, and then about 800 years later, carbon dioxide levels go up. All right, next one. They said back in 2000 that we're bound to have extreme warming or lots of warming. CO2 levels would go up, they said, and this was the range at which CO2 levels would go up in this, this blue one. Well, they did go up, not by quite as much, but they did go up. And they said temperatures would go up in that range. Well, actually, they went down. So, theory failed, end of story. But funnily enough, no, they didn't. They then changed the data so the temperatures didn't go down. Marvellous, isn't it? If your son does that in a physics lesson, he'd probably get a black mark, wouldn't he? And if he did it on the stock exchange, he'd probably get put in prison, wouldn't he? Well, maybe not, but, you know, <laughs> should be. Um, next one. <coughs> right, what's actually happening? This is all their models and what they say will happen or would happen. And this is what has happened if you look at uh, weather data from balloons or satellites. There's actually a decline going on now. Now, it won't be long before they fiddle these as well, but right now, they're showing a decline. Uh, not a big decline, but a decline. I, I showed this one on uh, the um, uh, Andrew Neil show, which distressed him greatly, but, you know. <laughs> <there we are. laughs> okay, there was a little trick involved there, both in me being there and me, them inviting me, but Monday. All right, next one. Right, they changed the facts. See, this is quite clever what they did. They did it in such a way so they can convince politicians. What we have here is, you see, the, there's a black one, which I can't quite see, but there's a black line, there's a black line there, da -da 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 -da, and it goes to about here, right? So that's the 1990 data set, no, sorry, the 2001 data set, which was that, they produced that in 2001, so this is how world temperatures went, okay? So they'd gone up by a certain amount in that time. But then they produced more and more data sets which made it colder in the past and warmer in the present. So then they go up by that amount instead. And the difference between them, you can't see the jump in that one because it's too faint on this graph, is that, half a degree. So there's half a degree of lie in there. And, uh, you know, a politician might ask them, oh, but yes, Minister, yes, Minister, this is the best available data. It's different data, Minister, but it's now the best data. So you can go and lie in Parliament Safely. Okay. Um, it is trickery. It is complete trickery. 
Uh, and this is a graph of what is happening under the um, uh, satellite data. All right, <coughs> next one. Uh, to achieve this, one of the things they did was reduce the number of weather stations around the world. They removed the ones they didn't like in 1990 or in a few years after that. So this is the number of weather stations, the blue, and this is the world temperatures. So they went up. Dear me. It's a bit like Enron, isn't it? Okay. Next one. Oh, now this graph, you must remember this if you don't remember anything. This was produced by Timo Naroma, who's now dead, who was on the original Climate Skeptics International email group. Uh, and he's got... This is um, solar activity, but we, we know that smoothed out solar activity corresponds to temperatures. And he's got these, these are 10 hail cycles apart. A hail cycle is 22 years, which is twice the single solar cycle of 11 years. And it's 22 years because the magnetic direction of the sun changes every 11 years. So we've got a 22 year magnetic cycle. He said, well, it's funny enough, if you take 10 of these, put these solar activity data 10 hail cycles apart, they follow each other reasonably. I mean, it's you know, a smoothed out thing. Well, so this is what happened in the past, and we are now here at the knee, or just a bit beyond the knee. I mean, it's getting colder, and it's going to be getting colder and colder. So we're heading for this 2031, 2035. Very cold, so there'll be ice flows in Northern Ireland, for example, crop failures in a lot of places, more rain in Spain. Okay, uh, including on the plane. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, so what should we do about this uh, conspiracy of nature? Well, we've got to destroy these sacred cows. First of all, the idea that 97% of scientists believe the theory is false, it's actually about 0.7%. The rest of them have just written papers putting global warming in the headline and taken the grant. Um, the idea that CO2 could drive temperatures up is untrue. The world is warming. No, it's not. Sea level rising fast. No, it's not. World all these things are untrue. Just remember them all, if you don't mind. Um, and uh, this thing about extreme events driven by CO2, that is totally wrong. They're the wrong type of extremes. But what we've got to do is advance real science and call the fraudsters to account and build Clexit, climate uh, climate agreement exit, it means. Now, right now, we have both Donald Trump and uh, Vladimir Putin saying that man-made climate change is nonsense. And that is a big step forward. They're both saying that. So they do have something in common. He'll change his mind next week. <laughs> Pun? He'll change his mind next week. Uh, well, yeah, but we'll wait for the week after then. Okay. <laughs> okay. I mean, yeah, right. quote him on the right day, that's all. Uh, <laughs> right, uh, how much time have we got, Ian? Um, we've got oh, we're doing all right then, just about all right, okay. Um, right, why does climate change physics fail? Well, they're, they're lying, actually. Um, but first of all, this thing about those radiation arrows on the diagrams you've seen. They show these arrows going up and hitting clouds and then some arrows come back and warms the ground. Well, it's nonsense. And I'll, I'll just prove to that you it is nonsense. So I, I need um, a person. The person wants to stand up and I'll, they can be the ground. All right, you can be the ground, citizen, all right. So you're, you stand there. <coughs> okay. So he's the ground, if you like, and there's the sky over there, right? So he's in equilibrium or he's radiating away heat to the sky, okay? Okay. Now, I'm some CO2, or some soot, or anything that gets in the way, and I stand in front of him. Okay. Now, he's going to radiate to me, and I'm going to reach the same temperature as him. And then I am going to radiate to the sky, the same as he was radiating to me. So there's no change. He doesn't get any warmer. The sky gets what it did before. So the, the extra bit of CO2 has no difference. No difference. Now. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank the uh, uh, demonstrator. Um, now, there is a more subtle issue about 
the lapse rate and all that, which we can come to but better in the workshop because we've got other things to do or in questions. But you see, that basic thing doesn't work. Uh, the second thing is they ignore the sea-air interface. Well, you can't ignore it. It's basic physics that the gas-liquid interface will have an equilibrium dynamic of gas flowing in and out. It's got to happen. I mean, you, you know, well, well, why should physics end just because Tony Blair wants it to? I don't think, don't think it will. <laughs> and, and the law concerned is called Henry's Law, by the way. Um, and the other thing is about non-equilibrium thermodynamics, which is that things are changing all the time, whereas the, uh, the models they use talk about, they're always about static situations. And as an example, right, they say, this thing about a hot spot in the upper atmosphere, they say, well, this warming will make a hot spot in the upper atmosphere um, because the, the, the heat will get concentrated there for various reasons. Now, okay. However, if you think about it, in the upper atmosphere, you're going to have uh, day and night fluctuations of temperature. Okay. This, 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 my hand going up and down is temperature going up and down now at a high level in the atmosphere. Okay. If you have more CO2 or more greenhouse gas or more sulfur or anything, the, this atmosphere will radiate quicker outwards and it will cool quicker. So it's going to be a bigger range. All right. Now, the amount of power going out into the sky up there, because this is the upper atmosphere, it goes off into space, is the average of, it's the fourth power of the highest one with the fourth power of the lowest, because that's how radiation works, according to fourth power temperature. Well, the fourth power of that average with the fourth power of that is much bigger than the fourth power of the mean. Like one plus two plus, one, two, and three are three numbers. One to the fourth plus three to the fourth averaged is much bigger than two to the fourth. You understand? So what you should actually see is a cooling. You do see a cooling. Where they had the hot spot, and we can show a, a, a evidence later, there's actually a cold spot. Okay? You should applause there. Okay, thank you. <coughs> now, exciting bit. Some of the politics of it all. <coughs> in 2004, I was invited to the Global Oil Summit by people involved in the climate change con. Okay, now I didn't know why the hell they wanted me there, frankly, but okay. I gave this talk at the Global Oil Summit, and I walked in, I thought, there's not many people here. It was at half the size of this room. I thought, oh, what's this Global Oil Summit? Then I realized who the hell was there. There was the head of Iraqi oil was there, Vladimir Putin's chief advisor, Andre Leonov, was there, and all these kind of top shots. Um, I gave this talk showed what's going on, and they all applauded, and Putin's advisor said, Mr. Corbyn, I want you to sit beside me at lunch. I said, mm, that's great, good idea. Now I'm walking along, and this guy rushes up to me, and said, Mr. Corbyn, I just want to show you something. And he flicked through this heap of paper. I said, and there was a graphs in there of solar activity, temperatures, stuff I was doing already. I said, what you got me here for, if you know it already? He said, ah, oh, we just wanted to check from a real scientist what's going on. I said, okay, that's fine. Uh, I said, and who are you? He said, oh, well, I'm retiring this meeting, but I'm the chief executive of ExxonMobil. <laughs> ah, so Rex Tillerson must have been there and probably got elected that day as a matter of interest. But anyway, fine. So three months later, some friends of mine said, please, why don't you ask those bastards for some money? I said, yeah, okay, let's ask them for some money. And we also said we'd ask the other side, like the UN, for equal amounts of money, so we, you know, whatever. Anyway. <coughs> they were asked, and they said, oh, no, 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 no. We don't want to upset the Green Lobby. Huh? But they just agreed with us that it was all nonsense. We do not want to upset the Green Lobby. That was their words. Now, the point is, they discovered, or it's obvious, they wanted to know, one, what's true, two, what makes money. And they're different things. Okay. So that's what happened then in 2004. Now... Later on, we were invited, I was invited along with Richard Lindzen and others to Moscow uh, to talk about whether or not they should sign the Kyoto Protocol. The Russian Academy of Sciences hosted it, blah, 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 and they agreed, and the British Met Office were there, and they were very upset. They agreed that man-made climate change is nonsense, and Russia will not sign the Kyoto Protocol. Fantastic. Two months after that, 
I turned on the television and there's Vladimir Putin signing the Kyoto Protocol. So I phoned up my friends in Russia. I said, look, the Russian Academy of Sciences has spoken. Surely that's the answer. They said, ah, oh, Mr. Corbyn, Mr. Corbyn, I don't know how they say it in Russian. Um, he said, Beslan, Beslan. I said, what do you mean, Beslan? He said, Beslan, Beslan, Beslan. That, that's, that's all I can say, I've got to go. And he went. What was that about? Look, Beslan was that place in Chechnya, or in Russia, where the Chechen rebels had invaded a school and the Russian security forces piled in and killed loads of people. Well, what's that got to do with man-made climate change? Well, the answer came a couple of months after that. The Russians were in Chechnya killing, killing, killing and killing. And the West did nothing. They said nothing at all. So Putin had said, OK, no. International diplomacy, you move a chess piece around and you keep somebody happy and do a deal. And that's all that was going on. Uh, um, well, what's happening now is quite interesting, isn't it? That the, the, <laughs> well, ExxonMobil probably still want the climate change story because Rex Tillerson has been saying, oh, he doesn't quite agree with Trump on that. Interesting. Whereas Trump, of course doesn't want the climate change story because he, he wants to, you know, bring back coal in America and so forth. So uh, the point is, though, you can't trust these people uh, at all. OK, let's go on. How much more time have we got? 25 minutes. Oh, that's good. All right. So, yeah, where did it all come from? Well, uh, you know, uh, is the, you've heard about the Club of Rome saying, look, you know, any idea is a good idea if we can make it into a globalisation agenda. And the CO2 story is one of them. OK, next one. Oh, we'll see. Now, of course, there's a lot at stake on this. That's so all right. No, go on, go on, yeah. But what should we do? Uh, this isn't actually the end yet, but it could be a sub-end. Um, what you've got to do, people, is enjoy life. OK, and vote Labour. <laughs> and that'll help you enjoy life. Okay. <laughs> Should applaud that. Applaud that. Okay. <laughs> enjoy the planet. Don't feel guilty about driving that car around. And if you break the speed limit, don't hand it to your wife or husband and pretend they were driving. <laughs> I know Liberal Democrats tend to do that, but there's not, probably not many of them in here. Um, Accept that man can't change climate. Well, actually, man is meddling around with weather, certainly with, you know, uh, geoengineering and so on. But that's, um, I don't think it can be changed, you know, big time. Uh, it's an interesting question, that. But what's going on now is natural changes, all right? We have to end all these silly carbon reductions and carbon tax. We have to end these prayer wheels, these wind and we want our money back on these green electricity charges, which are theft. I mean, you know, you're paying, what, 20, 30% more on electricity bills. Well, I want all that money back for the last 10 years. We should demand it under a Labour government. Um, <laughs> but we should keep honest green policies to reduce smoke and, and chemical pollution. Uh, because, you know, that is important. If there's anything out of the green movement that's important, it's that. But, of course, that has been co-opted into other things. And use long-range forecasts, that's produced by me, and buy them, and then you get a free mug. Um, <laughs> but the key things going on, really, are now, and that comes into a slide in a minute, but accountability versus globalisation. The left against right type of agenda is not really it anymore. There's globalisation lobbies in all the political parties. In the Lib Dems, it's about 100%. In, uh, of globalisation. In, in the Tory party and Labour party, there's quite a fair amount of each in each, but I think the number of, uh, the type of globalisers are going up in the Tory party and going down in the Labour party. Okay, next one. Right, now this is, I don't know if we're going to have enough time now, but anyway. Uh, what do we actually do? Because we haven't sort of said much about what we actually do. The key thing is that we, Weather Action, can predict, do the next one as well, I think something appears in the blob. Um, through our solar lunar action technique, we can predict how the jet stream is going to change. Now that is amazing, because the jet stream governs world circulation. 
And there's similar issues on all planets as well. Next one. <coughs> so the question, what causes weather extremes? The answer is jet stream changes. What moves the jet stream? Our revolution is that jet stream changes are driven by solar particle magnetic activity, and that is modulated by the position of the moon um, with respect to the plane at which the Earth goes around the sun. And these shifts are largely predictable. Next one. Um, just a few examples. That we, this will take ages to go through all of them. But often, well, we do say that we're likely to have earthquakes associated with our periods of extra sun-earth magnetic influence. That is one here. We said there'd be major earthquakes in this period, wh wherever it was, 26th, I don't know which year. It wasn't this year. That's not here yet anyway. Um, uh, but it happened in this particular period. Uh, next one, we won't have time to go through all of these, but we just mentioned they happened. August 2016, heat wave, we said it had come, it did come. Next one, this is what our maps look like. Um, this is another map we made, they're, they're smarter than this, by the way, now, if you buy a forecast. Um, um, but we said there'd be a heat wave with that type of map. This is the map we predicted, this is the map that came, right? It is still a high in more or less the right place. Um, very successful weather forecast from 100 days ahead. Okay, next one. Same type of thing more recently this year, this uh, warm, warm March, uh, period in warm March. High pressure there, high pressure there. Um, and that was done from I don't know, a few weeks ahead, some weeks ahead anyway, five weeks ahead perhaps, six, anyway. Okay, next one. Um, uh, same sort of thing as a more exciting one I'm about to come to. Next one, yeah, this is uh, interesting. That's what we predicted, that's what happened. I mean, that's quite a dramatic thing for America. Uh, next one, this one. This is quite an impressive thing. We said that there would be what we call an R5 period, which is a lot of solar magnetic influence in the 1st to 4th of September last year. And that will involve... Uh, a number of things, which well, I'll go through them, which were confirmed. First of all, the, uh, one of these is speed and one of them is temperature of the solar wind. Both of them went up in the period first to the fourth. Geomagnetic activity, that is the wobbles in the magnetic field of the Earth due to impacts from the solar wind, which is the rush of particles coming from the sun of a million miles an hour, um, that went up on the first and went down on the fifth, i.e. first to fourth a peak. Where it was uh, at its peak of activity, the rate of drop of pressure on a hurricane Hermine, which had formed in this time window, was greatest. There we are. And when we got to the end of this peak of, of activity, Hermine started to increase in pressure again. Lastly, when Hermine had crossed Florida, it had shifted to the right, and the this was commented on by standard meteorologists, this is part of our predictions. All tropical storms shift to the right during R5 and R4 periods. R5 being the most intense, R4 the second intense, and so on. So we're really very pleased with that one. Okay, you could applaud that as well if you want. Okay. Um, <laughs> we won't have time for these, but just to say we just flick through them. The big storms that have happened in the last few years, we predicted all of them. Um, Storm Jude, Storm Frank, okay, if you go on the next one. Uh, this will be in the presentation that you can read I I in detail, but this was six months ahead, that's what we said in a conference in Geneva. A late October, very major damaging storm, okay. Next one, and it was very damaging in, we said on a par with the great storm of, of 87. It, well, that was true, but in, in the Netherlands rather than in Britain, but it's but a European hit this. Next one, um, same, similar, simultaneous events in America. Next one, ah uh, oh, yes, right, yes. Um, okay, if there's any truth in this theory, then the, when magnetic links and lunar modulation coincide, we might get similar weather. It's not gonna be clockwork, but we might get similar weather. So, um, uh, if you look back, say, um, uh, five times 22, what's that? Uh, sorry, six times 22, uh, 132 years? Yeah. 
And seven times 19 is, is 133 or something like that, I think. Am I right there? Okay. So about 132 years ago or so, you might get similar things happening. Okay. Next one. So I gave this a dinner in Imperial College in 2007. I said, hey, guys, look, 1875, there were floods, and we've just had, uh, you know, people singing in Wimbledon that it was raining and so forth. What's his name? Um, Anyway, I said, look, if, if this is true this year, it might happen the next few years. And they said, oh, yeah, yeah, Piers, OK, come on. Anyway, but it did. 2007, there were floods. 2008, there were floods, all corresponding to these years. 2010 and 70, 78, there wasn't. Then 2012 and 1880, there was floods, 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 and floods. But in both those years. Right, because 6 times 22 and 7 times 19 is about the same. Now, it, it's not clockwork, so I have to say don't. You know, because it, it, it could be a year out, in which case, you're, or two years out, you're in a mess. But the point is, these things did happen. If we just go to the next picture, this is, no, no, back, back you did that one. This is the Met Office's uh, barbecue summer of 2007. <laughs> and that was their one of 2008. And that was their one of 2009. Well, if you have barbecues in the rain, it's okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> that was what we were right, and they were not right. Okay. Their short-range forecasts, though, to be fair, have improved a lot. I mean, their, their detail on rain, detail and floods within the next 12 hours is, are now fantastic, right? They're, they're, they're now fantastic. Okay, next one. Um, whole list of things we did predict. There might be time to do one of these. Uh, we'd, I won't read them all out now, but we'll just go... Next one. This one we want to have a look at. We said that the... Um, West Russian heat wave would break down around the middle of August. And we want to have a look at this film now, which I think Matthew's about to switch on. Next slide, all right. Now, ta da there we are. This is August the 15th, 20... Uh, what did I say? 2015, did I say that? Whatever it was, anyway. <coughs> right. Great big double... Double sunspot. There's meant to be music with this, but it's obviously gone. Oh, fantastic. See that thing break away? And another one. I mean, this is speeded up, but this was very, very, very rapid and powerful. There we are. Wisdom. Okay, <laughs> quick applause, a round of applause on that. Okay, um, next one. We haven't got, but well, the next slide shows that 15 hours after that or so means that the, there were influences moving at half the speed of light. We had thunderstorms in Leningrad, uh, uh, St. Petersburg, whatever it's called now, um, uh, and the Russian, West Russian heat wave collapsed. Okay. Next thing worth mentioning, that was 2010. It was December 2010 then. I predicted it would be the coldest December for 100 years. And David Cameron announced afterwards that it was the coldest December for 100 years, so it must be true. <laughs> OK. But anyway, I predicted this. And uh, then uh, I was in the middle of it. I was in the National Liberal Club by the river with some friends who go to those sort of places, but I'm not a liberal. Um, uh, <laughs> And I was phoned up by the BBC. They said, uh, Mr. Corbyn, uh, we understand you predicted this. Will you come on the TV in the morning? I said, yeah, OK, I'll do that. Anyway, two hours. And they said, oh, all right, we'll arrange a taxi and we'll phone you back. Right. Two hours later, nothing happened. So I phoned them up. I said, excuse me, uh, this taxi, what's going on? I said, oh, Mr. Corbyn, uh, sorry. Uh, mm, uh, I said, what's the problem? I said, ah, uh, we've got someone else. I said, oh, really, who? Ah. Uh, well, you can tell me. No, I can't. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. No, tell me. OK, all right. We've got the government's chief scientific advisor. <laughs> OK. To come instead. I said he knows F.A. <laughs> <laughs> and I used the Queen's English longer version of F.A. <laughs> and I haven't heard from him since. OK. <laughs> all right, next one. Yeah, this is to show you this solar lunar... Um, situation. What happens is, we say, look, if you've got on the sunspot cycles, you can count them, 21, 22, 23, um, 
as cycles. We're now in solar cycle 24, an even cycle. Odd cycles tend to be warmer. The most active part of odd cycles from the maximum to the minimum is marked in red, uh, uh, yellow, okay? If, and then these blue arrows are if you have a eclipse of the sun in the first half of December. Okay, now why that? Well, this is just a way of fixing what the uh, moon's orbit is doing. If you have an eclipse of the sun in the first half of December and you're near a peak of the odd cycle, you'll get warming. There you are, cycle 23, warming. 21, it missed a bit. 19, missed a bit. 17, hit. There it is. And so on. So that coincidence gives you the warming. A little rule. First shown in New York in 2008, I think, or something like that. Okay, next one. The same type of graph, just a different scale. Oh, that's the lies. If you flatten it out, it's more understandable. Next one. <coughs> right. Uh, people into electric universe stuff. This is like amazing coincidences. If you look at the sun, then, oh, the man standing up, is that five or ten minutes? Ten minutes, okay. If you look at the sun and see a sunspot, then it goes round and comes back after, on average, 27.2 days, if it's reasonably near the equator of the sun. Right. When the moon goes around the Earth, this could be the moon, the, uh, the, the mug, the moon goes down, it crosses the ecliptic, that level, goes under, and then comes back up again, right? That period to go right round once is... 27.2 days. It's the same. The same. Why is that? There's only one other planet um, moon pair where something like this happens. It's the Pluto and Charon, the moon of Pluto. The ratio of this, these two things then is 4.0. So these are whole numbers. <coughs> so there's some sort of feedback mechanism involving rotation and the solar wind and the whatever, okay? Which is putting the moon in a certain place. Which is interesting. So, you know, this is electromagnetism. We've got lots of ideas on this, which we haven't yet published, but the point is it happens. Okay, <coughs> next one, and <coughs> this is just to show that why odd cycles and even cycles of the sun are different. In a odd cycle, the main flow outwards is electrons slightly dominating. On the even cycle, the main flow outwards is actually protons. Okay, and these are gonna behave differently when they hit the Mercer magnetic field because these are lighter than them. Okay, next one. Um, just to show you, there's lots of stuff going on beyond the jet stream. The jet stream just goes here, but there's all this electrical stuff going on. And these electrical things go on more and more at the same time as the jet stream swings about more. Okay, next one. <coughs> there are connections between like these super duper, fantastic super lightnings <laughs> connecting the Earth to the stratosphere, which happen occasionally, or the ionosphere rather. Quite stunning stuff, but that is kind of, you know, taken in China. Now everyone's got a mobile phone and takes pictures. These are becoming more common. All right, next one, uh, a bit, technical, but the El Nino is a solar magnetic thing. Uh, we could discuss this on the workshop. Um, next one, the same thing, next one. Uh, right, what is really going on? Solar activity with the solar wind, the rush of particles from the sun at a million miles an hour, upsets the magnetosphere of the Earth and moves the jet stream, and then gives you circulation changes of weather and climate, which then govern, in the long term, CO2 levels. CO2 is the gas of life, good, not bad. What happens is not CO2 during this and that and that and that and that. CO2 does not drive the sun. The sun drives CO2. Tell your mother that, or your father, or your son, or your daughter, or your in-laws. Um, okay, next one. Right, it's what to expect now. Sun generally quieter, that's definitely happening. Very large amplitude swings in the jet stream. We said this some years ago, right? Definitely happening. General cooling, definitely happening. Rapid changes in weather, definitely happening. Uh, lots of technical stuff, definitely happening. More problems in Stanley meteorology, definitely happening. 
and a uh, we've covered that already. Okay, next one. Um, there's loads of examples of our successes here, which we'll just skate past, but I was very pleased with all these floods. <laughs> <laughs> and what happened in Newcastle? My, my father was born in North Shields, by the way, so I'm not against Newcastle. Um, all right, next one. Uh, yes, the 2013 uh, spring, I won the British Asparagus Starter Spring Season <laughs> competition. I said, asparagus for market will be five weeks late. And it was. So I won the competition and there's all the asparagus I got. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the Westbury White Horse around the time, which is very doer. Okay, next one. And this is a doer picture of Constable in the Dalton Minimum. But he also drew lots of doer pictures. Uh, and then he sold them to the French, even though they wanted to invade, which is a bit kind of weird, because what do they want to invade a country like this? I don't know, but <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Next one. We're almost there. Yeah. If we were to collaborate with standard mythology, which it could happen, I think it will happen, when there's more openness to things, which will happen under the next Labour government, by the way. Um, seriously. The, you see, what we say could be used to modify the equations used in computers now, right? So that the computer would know that actually, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. There's actually going to be more rain as a consequence than you think now because of these other influences. And then you get different maps out, right? So we're sure that can be done, and we're thinking about how to come forth with that idea. But if you buy our forecast, it will speed forth research. Um, next one. Right, this is what we're going to end on, on this stuff. And the other stuff is uh, more about the... There's some afters there, which we can use in, in the uh, workshops. <coughs> the left-right labels are now more and more out of date than they ever have been. I mean, people adopt them, but, you know, how, how can you say that bombing Libya and killing 140,000 people is left-wing? I mean, that's what, you know, Hillary Clinton did. Um, what we really have is accountability versus globalisation. And the fight against globalisation is all-pervading, covers all sorts of people um, and issues. And we have to sweep out fraud and corruption in science and fight for proper accountability and honesty in politics. You should applaud that. Okay, okay. Um, uh, yes, so what to do now? Well, I repeat, you've got to do your level best to get Labour in. Um, but, but, no, seriously, I mean, that is the most important thing before your being now. But in the general terms of this science and politics, we, you have to really focus on this stuff and understand it and, and sort of get rid of these party labels and talk to people in all parties and all activities, join any group campaigning against whatever, and again and again, fight for proper accountability and honesty and evidence-based science and politics. And I'll end there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Edwin. Thank you. Thank you. So, w one question. <laughs> Save it for the workshop. Well, that's a very big question. All right, well, uh, chemtrails, I would say they are real, they are happening. Um, I don't think they're having as big an influence as they want them to have, and I think they're essentially experimental now. And the reason why I say they're not actually working is because we predict there's going to be an R4 or R5 period, and then these things happen. Now, I don't believe that the people doing harp or chemtrails or whatever are reading our forecast and thinking, oh, Piers says it's going to rain, all right, let's give him some rain. I don't, don't think they're doing that. So, you know, we're, we're ahead of the game. But the long-range aim they have is weather control for military purposes, right? Ruining crops and whatever, causing big storms, whatever. That's what they want to do. 
Is it achievable? I don't know. I mean, the world is bigger and more self-correcting than they would like to believe. But it's a serious issue. It should be discussed in Parliament and never has been. And I'll be doing my best in the next Parliament to make sure it does get discussed. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>